Okay. Good morning, everybody. So today uh, we will discuss stochastic processes, namely infinite collections of random variables. I have two reasons to discuss this subject with you. The first reason is that uh, this is the entrance to uh, a second course in probability, so which is IE 521 next semester. So if you think of uh, con uh, continuing uh, with that course, uh, this could be like the first lecture maybe, or some bridge between this course and the second course. Uh, the second reason is that our last topic is convergence of sequences of random variables. And whenever you have a sequence of random variables, uh, you're talking about a stochastic process in discrete time. You can always see an, a sequence of uh, random variables as a stochastic process in discrete time. Therefore, we should at least uh, uh, discuss why they exist, if they exist, and how they exist, how we define them as measurable objects in giant uh, product spaces. So these are the two reasons to discuss this subject. But it's going to be very brief. Uh, and I think there are almost no proofs today. Uh, I will just talk about some definitions, some ideas, and uh, some, some uh, simple results. And probably in the second hour, we're going to discuss a simple class of stochastic processes, namely Bernoulli processes. And these are the stochastic processes that appear in the study of uh, infinite coin tossings, uh, infinite coin tossing uh, examples. Uh, we've been talking about such uh, examples of coin tossing uh, starting from week one. Uh, so it is worth spending some time on uh, studying it as a stochastic process now. Okay. So uh, this is our fifth chapter, very brief chapter, infinite collections of random variables. So the first one is infinite product spaces. So what have we done so far? What have we done so far in this course? So we always have a probability space in the background. And whenever we say we have a random variable, this means we have a, an additional measurable space serving as the image space. And we have a function from omega to e, which is measurable with respect to measurable with respect to script e and f, right? Meaning that you pick one set in the sigma algebra and look at the pre-image of the set under x, this must be measurable, meaning that it must be a set in our sigma algebra of the probability space. So if you take E as the real line with its Borel sigma algebra, you have real valued random variables. And if you consider some discrete sets uh, with their discrete sigma algebras, uh, their power sets, you have discrete random variables. If you take this as the extended real line with the Borel sigma algebra on the extended real line, you have uh, numerical random variables. And another special case we discussed separately is the case of random vectors. So what is a random vector? Well, random vector is a special kind of random variable whose image space is a product of bunch of, indeed, finitely many uh, measurable spaces. So we had measurable spaces, E0, E1, 
en okay and a random vector is nothing but a random variable defined on omega mapping into the product of those EIs and of course there is a sigma algebra on this Cartesian product so this is measurable with respect to the product sigma algebra which is defined as the sigma algebra generated by the collection of all measurable rectangles and F What is important and nice about a random vector is that once you see it as a single random variable x, you can talk about its distribution. Right? If you have a generic random variable, its distribution is the image measure, right? It's the image measure which is a measure on E. Therefore, now the distribution is going to be on the product space, a measure, a probability measure on the product space. How do we specify this distribution? Well, last week we looked at the case with two spaces and we said that a joint distribution can always be decomposed or disintegrated into a measure on the first space and the transition probability kernel from the first space to the second. So there is a multidimensional generalization of this disintegration theorem, multidimensional this integration theorem which says that if we have E1 to En not necessarily E0 but if these are our standard measurable spaces then there exists the following objects. So there exists a measure, a measure, uh, let me write it this way, a measure nu zero on E zero. Uh, well, this is a probability measure, a probability measure. Uh, transition probability kernel K1 from the space number 0 into space number 1. Another transition probability kernel K2 from the product of the first two spaces. So this is going to be the conditional distribution given the first two coordinates, and so on. And finally, a transition probability kernel, Kn, from the product of the first spaces up to number n minus 1, into the last space, such that such that this joint distribution, how did I call it? Well, let's call it pi, OK? Pi is nu 0 cross k1 up to kn. Or I can write it as pi, because I can write it as pi as a measure on the product sigma algebra, dx0 
up to dxn. This is equal to nu0 dx0, k1 x0. So first variable is what is given, right? K, uh, x0, 2 dx1, k2, x0, x1, and dx2. So given the positions at times 0 and 1, and now we're looking at the distribution of the coordinate time uh, number 2, at time 2. Kn, given all the coordinates so far, up to n minus 1, and now we're looking at the distribution, the conditional distribution of the last coordinate at time n. So if you like, we can also write it as follows. So x0 in dx0, xn in dxn, is the distribution of the coordinate, the position at time 0, times the conditional distribution of the position at time 1, given my position at time 0. Uh, let me skip the k2. And now kn is what? It's the conditional distribution of the position at time n, given all the positions at times 0 to n minus 1, right? This is nu 0, this is k1, I skip k2, and this is kn. And this is the joint distribution. Okay? So this is the multidimensional uh, disintegration theorem. It, it is very logical, right? So you want to calculate the probability of being in some set in the, uh, for, for all the coordinates. And you should be able to calculate it as the distribution at time 0 times the conditional distribution at time 1 given the position at time 0 times the conditional distribution at time 2 given my positions at time 0 and 1, etc., etc. My conditional distribution of, uh, at time n given my coordinates, my positions at times 0 to n minus 1, right? Uh, so if you like, you, this, is like uh, this is like a formula. So, uh, OK, A given, sorry, A intersection B intersection C is uh, C. B given C and A given B intersection C. Did I write it? OK, is it fine? OK, so OK, time 0, time 1 given time 0, time 2 given times 0 and 1, right? And indeed, uh, so this version is not very difficult to check, I guess. So let's see. A intersection, B intersection, C, B intersection, C. They go away, and we get this, right? So I just use the elementary definition of conditional probability, right? B intersection, C divided by C, A intersection, B intersection, C divided by B intersection, C. And if they are all positive, if those denominators are all positive, I immediately get that this is equal to A intersection, B intersection, C. So this is like the abstract version of that formula over there. What is nice about this formula is that uh, you don't need to have that this has strictly positive probability. This can have zero probability, and this formula is still valid. Um, so that's why we introduced all that machinery with kernels, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But the idea behind this is quite simple. It's just this formula, right? Just this formula. Okay, so now this is what we have done so far. This is what we have done so far, stated in a slightly more general way. So we usually looked at the case with just two coordinates, two times. 0 and 1, maybe. Now uh, I just stated this in, in, a, in the general case. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is to extend this further to 
infinite collections of uh, random variables. Okay? So for this, I'm going to take an arbitrary index set for time. So the index set here is uh, 0, 1, 2, etc., up to n. Now we're going to take an arbitrary index set, infinite collection. Okay. So let t be an arbitrary index set, countable, uncountable, whatever. And for each t, let e t script e t be a measurable space. And let xt be a random variable with values in et. So the collection xt indexed by this t index t is called a stochastic process with index set t. So this is the definition of a stochastic process. Any collection of random variables is called a stochastic process. And the index set can be anything. Index set can be anything. Uh, of course, if the index set is a singleton, it doesn't make too much sense to call it a stochastic process. It is just one random variable. And if uh, the index set is finite, again, we use the terminology of random vectors. Again, it doesn't make too much sense to call them stochastic processes. But uh, as a special case, of course, we can take t as 0 to n, which gives us a random vector. Okay? So let's call it x, OK? x is the infinite collection, possibly infinite collection. So now x becomes x0 to xn, which is a random vector. Random. And we know how to deal with them, right? This board tells us how to deal with them. So we're more interested in the uh, case where this is an infinite collection. So if t is n, or sometimes we also include 0, so this is called a discrete time stochastic process. Discrete time stochastic process. So we have x, which is x1, x2, etc., or x starting from time 0, mostly uh, people tend to start time uh, from 0, because this is what happens in continuous time, right? So if you have t equals r plus, so the idea is that we have an origin of time, time 0, and we start running the experiment uh, at, that, at that time. Uh, and we, we, uh, we observe a random phenomenon starting from uh, some random phenomenon starting from time zero and onward. Okay, so uh, things start at time zero and continues. Okay, so this is now a stochastic process with index at r plus. So this is a continuous time stochastic process. Continuous time. And there is one more special case I'd like to discuss with you. So um, here I said uh, t is just an arbitrary index set. And I didn't say like it should be a subset of the extended real line or anything. Okay? It doesn't have to be the sub a subset of the extended real line. 
Indeed, it can be a multi-dimensional set. So let's pick it RD, OK? So now it doesn't make sense as a time, because time is a one-dimensional thing in our minds, right? So it doesn't make sense as a time, but rather this is a field. So this is called a random field. And as t is a d-dimensional object, this is indeed like t1 to td, right? This is our t1 to td, which is the index. So the index is d-dimensional. So random field. And uh, a very typical application of random fields is, uh, for instance, you consider some uh, fluid, some water, okay, let's say ocean. Okay. And you have points in the ocean, right? Positions in the ocean. T, let's say T1, T2. My picture is two-dimensional, but of course ocean is three-dimensional. So we have to tell what is x here, okay? So x of t. So for instance, we can take xt as the velocity of the water molecule at point T. As I use T, it's really, uh, I really want to say time, but it is not time. It is really a point in the ocean at point T. Well, uh, if this is ocean, let's make it two or three dimensional. So in that case, it is called a velocity field. Uh, because uh, there is so much randomness in ocean, uh, so it, is, it makes sense to model the velocity of this water molecule at that point as a random variable, right? And create a, build a model uh, for, for the velocities of those points. At, at each point, we have a velocity vector. Uh, so this x is also probably taking values in R2, right? It's a two-dimensional velocity uh, because if we live in two dimensions, right? Uh, if the position is two-dimensional, the velocity should be two-dimensional. And, uh, and then we, this creates a random field, uh, namely a stochastic process whose index is not time, uh, whose index set is multidimensional. Okay. Um, so such models are used in uh, oceanography and uh, physics. OK, random fields. And of course, one can consider other uh, uh, examples where this index set comes from a, a general metric space, et cetera, et cetera. So the point of all those examples is that we can see a stochastic process. So we can see x indexed by t as a single function, single function x defined on omega into the Cartesian product of all those ET spaces. Okay, What is the Cartesian product of infinitely many sets? Well, by definition, it is the set of functions from okay so 
So this is a yeah, set of functions or collection of points such that each point belongs to the right space for each t. So one realization of a random vector is nothing but a point in the Euclidean space. But I can also see one realization in this Euclidean space as a function defined on the index set, 0 to n, right? So I can see it as a function to, let's say, the union of all ETs, such that x of t, which we also write as x sub t, is in ET for each t. This is the definition of infinite Cartesian product, just set of functions defined on the index set. Because if your index set is 0, 1, 2, then a function on 0, 1, 2 can be seen as a vector, right? As a special case. So we can always see a vector as a function. And in, in the general case, we can define the Cartesian product as a set of functions, as a set of functions. With the condition that at each point t, its value comes from the right space, the correct space. Well, the Cartesian product of all those ETs makes sense. But can we define a sigma algebra on this huge Cartesian product so that the measurability of x as a random variable makes sense. Because in the finite dimensional case, I have a sigma algebra here, this product sigma algebra. And then I can view it as just a single random variable. So when I say x is a random vector or x is a random variable with this image space, it's the, 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 the meaning of its measurability is clear because we have, a, we have a sigma algebra on the image space. So can we have a similar sigma algebra on, the, on an infinite product? On an infinite product. Can we have the product sigma algebra of ETs where t runs through a possibly infinite index set? That's what we're going to discuss right now. And indeed, there is such a notion. So it's going to be the infinite uh, sigma algebra, infinite product sigma algebra. But first, we need a notion of a measurable rectangle again, OK? Measurable rectangle. So a set D, which is a subset of the huge Cartesian product, is called a finite dimensional measurable rectangle if it is of the form the Cartesian product of some DTs. for some dt in et for each t, such that dt is equal to et for all but finitely many t in t. Okay. An example 
let's say we are in, uh, let's say we look at the case where t is just n, okay? One, two, three, four, five. We look at the infinite product of them. So a finite dimensional rectangle is, for instance, this. And let's say et is just r for all t. Okay. So here's a finite dimensional rectangle. Well, 0, 1, 2, 5, singleton 3, r, OK? 1, 2, 3, r, r, r. So r forever. r forever. Finite dimensional rectangle means you can have a non-trivial set, a set that is different from the full space in only finitely many coordinates. Therefore, if you look at the index set, which is the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, etc., you can only have a finitely many of them being different from the full space. The rest must be equal to the full space so that it is a finite dimensional rectangle. Okay? Always R. So this is, a, this is a measurable rectangle, finite dimensional measurable rectangle. And now comes the definition of product sigma algebra. The product sigma algebra is the sigma algebra on ET generated by collection of all finite dimensional measurable rectangles. So once you have the notion of rectangle in the infinite space, infinite case, you can uh, just come up with the definition of uh, product sigma algebra. Just as a remark, the collection of all finite dimensional measurable rectangles, what should be the remark? the collection of all finite dimensional measurable rectangles form a, what kind of a collection is that? You have measurable rectangles. What, what is the property of the collection of measurable rectangles in the finite dimensional case? You just have measurable rectangles, right? So the collection of all measurable rectangles is not a sigma algebra, but a pi system, right? Again, this is a pi system because if you uh, intersect two finite dimensional measurable rectangles, it is still a finite dimensional measurable rectangle. Form a pi system. Therefore, a probability measure, probability measure on this huge product sigma algebra, or product measurable space, is uniquely determined by its values on finite dimensional measurable rectangles. So now we can talk about the measurability of x. Now we can talk about t 
the measurability of this stochastic process x viewed as a single function defined on omega mapping into the Cartesian product of everything. Because now we have a sigma algebra here, the pre-image of every set in this product sigma algebra must be in f. That's the definition of measurability, the usual definition of measurability. The nice thing about this product sigma algebra defined in terms of finite dimensional measurable rectangles is that it is not a difficult notion. Indeed, x is measurable with respect to x is measurable with respect to this full product, of course, and f, if and only if xt is measurable with respect to its own sigma algebra and f for every t. So measurability with respect to this giant product sigma algebra is just equivalent to the measurability of every coordinate with respect to its own sigma algebra. Uh, just like in the random vector case, right? Uh, a function mapping into, the, into Rn, uh, a function mapping into Rn is measurable if and only if every component x1, x2, xn are measurable as real valued random variables, right? So, uh, Measurability with respect to product sigma algebra, uh, well, you have to think about that in order to define it. But once you define it, it is this nice consequence um, whose proof is not difficult, but uh, let's skip it. Okay. Just uh, you need to play with the definition of this product sigma algebra. So what is more interesting for us is the distribution of this random variable, this stochastic process viewed as a single random variable, distribution of x. And since x is a stochastic process, there is a special name for that, the sometimes called probability law and sometimes just called law of process x of process x. So this means what? We are looking at a set coming from the product sigma algebra. And we look at the event that this infinite collection as a function on omega mapping into this Cartesian product takes values in this event, which can be quite crazy. Okay? So it is this mapping. Okay? So it's a measure on, it's a probability measure on the huge product sigma algebra. What is nice about this probability law is that by the remark, by this remark, you don't need to look at all those crazy sets in the product sigma algebra. The law of x, the law of x is uniquely determined by its finite dimensional distribution, namely probabilities of the form xt1 in d1, dt1, xtn in dtn, where dt1 is coming from script et1, dtn is coming from script etn, t1 to tn are in t, and n is finite. So just pick one measurable rectangle, meaning that pick a finite number, finitely many indices, finitely many points in time, and look at the distribution of the stochastic process at only those coordinates, at only points in time. If you're in 
continuous time, 0 to infinity, just fix t1, t2, tn, you have a huge stochastic process, right? So just look at xt1, xt2, xtn, and the joint distribution of xt1 to xtn. This, this distribution of this vector, which is finite dimension, right? So if you can do that, if you can specify the distribution of all possible random vectors that you can generate, namely for all possible choices of t1 to tn, and for all possible choices of n as well, so it can be 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., etc., this means you specify uniquely the law of the process x. Because the law of the process x is just its distribution as a single random variable. But this is a measure on the product sigma algebra, which is generated by finite dimensional measurable rectangles. And since those finite dimensional measurable rectangles form a pi system, in order to define, in order to specify a probability measure, in that case, it is the distribution of x. In order to specify the distribution of x, all you have to do is to specify its distribution on finite index sets, namely the distributions of those random vectors. Okay. So if you know the, if you know that such a process exists, okay, if you know that such a process exists with a certain law, then you can specify its law in terms of its finite dimensional distributions. But it doesn't mean that if you just tell somebody to construct a stochastic process with specified, pre-specified finite dimensional distributions, it doesn't mean that this person can come up with a probability space and a stochastic process whose law has those finite dimensional distributions. So the question is, given finite dimensional distributions does there exist a probability space on which there is a process whose finite dimensional which admits which admits uh, those finite dimensional distributions well that's a difficult question in general but in discrete time, there is an answer for this, which we're going to discuss. Discrete time. The so-called ionescu tulsea theorem provides an answer for this question. And in continuous time, there is Kolmogorov's extension theorem, which we're not going to discuss. Kolmogorov's extension so those theorems tell you under what situations you can guarantee the existence of a stochastic process with pre-specified finite dimensional distributions. Okay? I'm going to make it precise for the discrete time case now. So let's say we have the index set equal to z plus. So our time is discrete time 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And for each t, we have a measurable space. Let's say it is standard, okay?
I guess you don't need the standardness of the space number zero, but anyway. OK, here's what is given to us. So given or specified. So the question is as follows. Does there exist a stochastic process in discrete time? Whose distribution at time 0 is this? Whose distribution at time 0 and 1 is this? Whose distribution at time 0, 1, 2, 3 is this? Etc. So I tell you all the distributions in finite dimensional case. Okay? I tell you the distribution of the vector x0 to x5, x0 to x6, x0 to x7. And then the theorem should guarantee the existence of a stochastic process, which is infinite dimensional, right? Zero to infinity, who, which admits these finite dimensional distributions. So this is what this theorem is concerned with. So therefore, what is given to us is, is as follows. So uh, probability measure nu zero on E zero. It's going to be the same. Uh, with what I just erased here. So a transition probability kernel, K1 from E1, sorry, E0 to E1, blah, 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 a transition probability kernel, Kn from the product of the first, uh, the, the space is up to time n minus 1 into En. And I don't stop. Since it goes forever, right? we don't stop at time n. It goes forever. Okay. So in other words, for each n, such a transition probability kernel is given. And uh, at time 0, we are given the initial distribution. Okay. So here's the construction. So let's construct a probability space. Uh, Let's say uh, canonical measurable space or, or yeah, measurable space, measurable space. Canonical means just standard. And here's what we're going to take. Just omega is et from 0 to infinity. So let me write it as t in n, t in z plus, and f as the product sigma algebra. And what is p? Well, p is we don't know. This is what we'd like to construct. And also define x as the identity mapping identity mapping, meaning that every omega in this set is omega 0, omega 1, etc. And therefore, x of omega is just omega itself, which is omega 0, omega 1, etc. And xn is nothing but the nth coordinate, nth coordinate mapping coordinate mapping. So let's construct the following probability measures. Well, on E0, we have nu0, right? Already given as a probability measure. It's the space at time 0. So if I take j0 
just nu zero as the probability measure, this is my, this is my uh, space at time zero, probability space at time zero. We're going to consider time zero and one together. And the probability measure here is going to be the product of nu zero and k1, which is going to be the joint distribution of x0 and x1, x0 and x1. e0, e1, e2, e0, e1, e2, nu0, k1, k2, etc. Okay. So let's call it pi 0, let's call it pi 1, let's call it pi 2, etc. So uh, we are ready to state INS-Kutulsia theorem, but uh, let's give a break.